In 1902, while on a military mission in Central Africa, a German army captain named von Beringa shot and killed two mysterious creatures. He then sent the skull and bones of one of them back home to Germany. That creature has been luring people back to Central Africa ever since. In 1921, American naturalist Carl Akeley made his way to the gorilla's ancestral home. The Virunga Volcanoes, in what was then the Belgian Congo. Akeley brought a movie camera to document his visit. And a little girl to help prove Africa wasn't such a dark continent. But there was much more to Akeley's expedition. Akeley had come to collect mountain gorilla specimens for exhibit in New York. the men stared into the eyes of a dead mountain gorilla. They saw a man-like creature staring back at them. Akeley decided the killing must end. He urged Belgium's King Albert to make a permanent sanctuary of the gorilla's home. Today, in the cold, rainy high ground of Rwanda, Uganda, and Zaire, the gorillas live on much as they have for thousands of years. mountain home is tiny and isolated, pressed in on all sides by people and farmland. More and more the mountain gorilla's future lies in human hands. American field biologist George Schaller was the first person to study mountain gorilla behavior. He and his wife Kay spent a year in the forest in 1959. A number of other scientists have followed, among them,
current director of the Karasoki Research Center, Diane Doran. Hi. Hi. We made it. Good to see you. Hi. Hi, nice to see you. We made it just in time. The patrol's going out, and uh, I was going out to see gorillas in Baraburguiza. Would you like to come along? Wonderful. Great. Okay. Tugende. Tugende Guiza. Gorilla researcher Diane Fossey established Karasoki in 1967 in the forest she grew to love. For Schaller, too, the forest became an enchanted place. Some of my most magical moments with wild animals were watching gorillas, staying with them day and night. I used to do all my own gorilla tracking. You walk along slowly, you see the broken vegetation, you smell the animals. There's the musty, somewhat sweet odor of gorillas in the air. When you follow them hour after hour, you adapt to their rhythm of doing things. You move at their speed. You start thinking at their speed, almost. And that is a lovely feeling for a biologist, to seemingly enter into the lives of the animals without disturbing them. When approaching the animals, scientists try not to be too quiet. Mountain gorillas like to know when people are near. The mountain gorilla's day is spent feeding and resting. Feeding and resting and feeding some more. There are only a few hundred mountain gorillas left in the world. Most live as part of a family. The father and protector of this family is the male silverback, Umagumi. He acts as a magnet for the group. The females gather around him. Their infants and offspring gather around them. Mountain gorillas are social animals. 
The closeness begins in infancy. Rarely, if ever, does a mountain gorilla mother let her baby out of her sight. The baby, for his part, likes nothing better than to make contact with the other members of the group. Even when they spread out to begin their daily search for food, the gorillas continue to communicate with one another. While the adults devote most of their waking hours to foraging for food, the youngsters devote most of theirs to play. Park guards have named this three-year-old Nzeli. They call his friend Imvura. At eight years, Karira is a bit of a bully. Mushushwe is only four. The games they play help the youngsters determine their status in the group. Childhood can last anywhere from 8 to 12 years, but the gorilla's need to maintain their status never seems to end. Any opportunity to reinforce the hierarchy is seized upon. Then comes young adulthood.
At 13, Intuari has the beginnings of a silverback and his first real sense of the power that comes along with it. He also has a dedicated young male follower. But what Intuari really wants is the attention and allegiance of the females in the group. Umugumi doesn't seem too threatened by Intuari's advances towards the females. Well over 400 pounds, the dominant male silverback could easily discipline the younger one, or throw him out of the group altogether. For now, Umugumi seems content to focus on the local vegetation, of which he eats some 50 pounds a day. Mountain gorillas are mainly vegetarian, with a few ants and grubs thrown in for good measure. Their staple diet includes a bitter stinging mixture of thistles, nettles, goose grass, bamboo, and wild celery. Although he has already begun to experiment with the food his mother likes to eat, Abumwe will continue to rely on her milk until he's three years old. By the time he's four, Abumwe will be strong enough to forage on his own. Mountain gorillas are generally well adapted to the world in which they live. But however idyllic their home may appear, for the youngsters in the group, the mountains hold many perils. Many newborns simply don't survive. Mbele gave birth two days ago. It will be several months before she can even let go of her baby, much less let him out of her sight. The mountain gorillas are more vulnerable than they know. Their ancestral home is much smaller than it once was.
All around them, human activity is increasing. Yet the mountain gorillas continue to live and move in ways familiar to them for generations. They do not distinguish between thistles and meadows that are inside the park and thistles and meadows that are outside it. They simply go where their never-ending search for food takes them. Only now they find others there. Both the mountain gorillas and their forest sanctuary now receive official protection. Park guards and anti-poaching patrols go to the forest every day. To protect the gorillas and all the other wildlife, the patrols search for and destroy snares that local hunters have set for game.
The guards search the forest, checking on the gorilla's whereabouts and welfare. The same guards who name the mountain gorillas at birth follow their progress for years, watching as the gorillas grow to maturity. Over time, a close relationship develops, a bond between the animals and the men. Almost every day it rains. The mountain gorillas don't seem to like it. They don't seem to know what to do about it either, other than simply wait it out. At least the rain provides them with a rich supply of food.
After feeding, the family gathers around the silverback, Umagumi. While the adults rest, the youngsters play. For the group's leading young adult male, it's become much more than play. Left unchecked, Intuari's newfound strength could eventually tear the group apart. Threat Intuari represents puts females such as Poppy on edge. Determined to get some kind of reaction from the others, Intuari bites into an inedible plant and contemplates his next move. This time, even Umagumi seems uneasy. Intuari is presenting himself as their new leader, but the females don't see it that way. Having forced Intori out, the group moves on. Before she joins them, Poppy, still vibrating with excess energy, vents it on the first young male she can find. pushed out for good seems harsh, but what Intuari really needs now is time and space to mature, to the point where he too can have a family of his own. The next few years are critical for Intuari. They are also critical for all the other mountain gorillas. Whether the outside world will allow Intuari and the others the time and space they need is an open question.
One thing is certain. If the mountain gorillas are to survive, we will have to protect them and their forest home forever. If we ever turn our backs, they'll be gone.